G'day. I'd like to let you know that Aussie Med Ed is sponsored by Tigo. For most doctors, indemnity insurance is one of their biggest costs of practice. While many doctors are still with the same insurer they joined in medical school, many have made the switch to Tigo and benefited from it. The team at Tigo have told me that those new to private practice could qualify for four years of discounted premiums. To find out more about Tigo, visit tigo.com.au. That's T-E-G-O dot com dot A-U. G'day and welcome to the Aussie Med Ed, the Australian Medical Education Podcast, where we get to interview specialists in a variety of medical areas, asking their opinion on their certain conditions, and obtaining their insight into how they diagnose and treat that condition. In these COVID times, it's a way of replacing the relaxed discussion around the hospital by allowing the listener to put forward questions to be answered and addressed on their behalf. I hope you enjoy the whole program. Welcome once again to Aussie Med Ed. In this edition, we get to interview Dr. Martin Bruning, a general surgeon, where we discuss the topic of hernias. We introduce the idea of what needs to be known for an exam for medical students and the important aspects of hernias. Not only will this information be useful for the general practitioner seeing a patient on a regular basis, but also for the medical student revising for their exams or preparing for their OSCE examination. I'm Gavin Nyman, a North Peak surgeon based in Adelaide in South Australia. I'm the host of this podcast. I'd like to begin this podcast by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast has been produced. I pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Martin Bruni onto our show. He's a fellow of both the College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and Australia. He also has a Master's in Surgery. He's a Senior Consultant at Quindersworth Hospital and a Visiting Surgeon to Port Augusta, Sojourn and Roxby Downs. He holds the position of Senior Lecturer at the University of Adelaide and he's going to talk to us about the tips and tricks of hernias for the medical student. Welcome, Martin Bruni. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Gav, for the opportunity to uh, talk about hernias, which I think in the Parthenon of exam questions always gets a Guernsey, and I think students have a uh, uh, difficult time with inguinal hernias in particular. And then as you find yourself going through your surgical career, um, hernias can be uh, difficult to treat on occasion, and they're very common, so we all have to know something about them. Uh, It'd be fair to say that the inguinal hernia is the king of hernias in terms of uh, predominance. So 75% of all abdominal hernias are inguinal hernias. And as men, uh, we are 10 times more likely to get an inguinal hernia than women, uh, but women uh, are more likely to get a femoral hernia. Um, So... I guess in order, inguinal hernia is probably the, is the most common. Uh, femoral hernia is perhaps less common, but certainly uh, perhaps more of an emergency that you need to know what to do uh, for. Uh, incisional hernias are common, even in this day of increasing laparoscopic approaches to operations. And then uh, umbilical hernia, we can't forget our old friend, the umbilical hernia, because um, You know, there's quite a few percentage of uh, people that are born with an umbilical hernia. uh, And fortunately, that closes, uh, uh, usually self-resolves by the age of about, you know, two to three. So, uh, but of course, as we all get older and get that uh, middle age spread, uh, unlike our washboard stomachs, of course, Gav, um, (laughs) uh, the little belly button can pop out and uh, become a problem later in life. So... Look, inguinal and femoral hernias probably cause the most consternation and then it's incisional and then umbilical, I guess, in that order. And there are some more weird and wonderful hernias like the lumbar hernia of Petit, the Spigillian hernia, which is in the linear semilunaris um, uh, in the abdominal wall and, you know, other things like hiatus hernia. So I guess the first thing is a hernia is a protrusion of an organ from uh, within the cavity within which it is contained. So it's usually a defect or a breach of some sort. Now, uh, for inguinal hernias, of course, we all have natural defects there with the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring. Um, But of course, they can stretch with with time or there can be congenital reasons for the hernia. So I guess on that background, it's fair to say that the inguinal hernia is uh, very common. It's probably the most or at least the second most common general surgical procedure that gets performed and it always gets a Guernsey in exams so that's where it uh, uh, gets the uh, attention of medical students I guess. 
And what type of inguinal hernia is the most important ones, the direct or indirect, or which are more common? Well, the indirect is more common than the direct, um, so um, definition-wise, uh, the indirect is a hernia that emanates from the deep inguinal ring, or more anatomically, it's lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Now, a lot of people have difficulty with inguinal anatomy, and I've got no doubt that uh, people spend hours and hours looking at inguinal anatomy in the books, and, and really... There's no substitute for when you're a medical student actually going into theatre, asking to scrub in and actually having a look because uh, the anatomy books are pretty good these days and uh, all the computer programs and all that sort of thing. But until you actually uh, get your hands in there, it really is a difficult concept. So um, if we start at the beginning... And what I tell my medical students is there's really only two things you need to know in terms of anatomy. You need to know where your anterior superior iliac spine is, so everybody can feel that uh, on their iliac crest up the top, and your pubic tubercle. So everybody can feel that as well. If they go to the pubic symphysis and go laterally one way or the other, that knobbly little bit at the at the lateral edge of the pubic symphysis of the pubic tubercle. Now, if you've got those two anatomical landmarks, you've you've got the whole concept of inguinal hernias uh, and ligaments and canals and everything, you've got to start. So the the structure that runs from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle is the inguinal ligament. And that's, once again, it's one of the few things you need to know. So... That's one. That's an important landmark, obviously, and it represents the folded uh, lower border of the external oblique aponeurosis. So about halfway along that line or halfway along the mid-inguinal point, uh, there's your deep inguinal ring, and then just at the level of the pubic tubercle or just medial to it, you've got your superficial ring. So the space in between the deep ring and the superficial ring is the inguinal canal. And it's only a canal when you actually open it up. So it doesn't sort of exist like a nice, neat little channel tunnel or anything. It's just a space uh, through uh, the muscles and, and of course, through that, uh, the spermatic cord and its contents run. So the deep ring is bounded by, on the medial aspect, by the inferior epigastric vessels. So getting back to our anatomical definitions of a indirect versus a direct hernia, technically speaking, an indirect hernia emanates lateral to the epigastric vessels. A direct inguinal hernia emanates medial to the epigastric vessel. So it comes out, sort of punches out of the posterior inguinal canal wall and the indirect hernia are the ones that sort of slide down with the spermatic cord and can end up being uh, inguinoscrotal. And with the, um, there, are, there are two spikes where inguinal hernias occur. So one spike is from the zero to five year range. Another spike is in the plus 65 year range. So uh, in the younger age group, it's always due to a patent processus vaginalis. So that's the structure uh, which sort of uh, guides uh, and has the coverings for the testicle, uh, reaches the testicle at birth, and then it sort of obliterates. But in some people, that remains patent, so they will have uh, an inguinal hernia and it will be an indirect hernia. So hernias in children are pretty much always indirect. In adults, it's about two-thirds indirect, one-third direct. So on the basis of that, uh, that's... You know, that's that's the sort of story, I suppose, for indirect versus direct. Now, indirect, of course, has got a slightly greater propensity to strangulate and incarcerate, so, uh, but we sort of fix everything up pretty much the same way. Okay. The um, You've obviously touched upon this part of the causation, obviously a paediatric age group versus the older age group. What other causes? I was reading in a book that um, the actual intra-abdominal pressure is not thought to be such a greater risk as opposed to other collagen deficiencies and other factors as well. Yeah, well, that's right, Gav. Look, I think that uh, there's more research being done now because people have looked back at things and said, oh, well, you've just got a hernia because you've lifted too much or whatever. But when they've looked at the, the, at the facts and figures, 
if your dad had an inguinal hernia, you're probably four times more likely to get an inguinal hernia later in life than somebody whose parents didn't have an inguinal hernia, for instance. So there is a theory about uh, collagen makeup, and there's no doubt that people with Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have a higher incidence of inguinal hernia. And I guess you brought up the topic of raised intra-abdominal pressure. Of course, that's very important. And this goes back to, uh, you know, the basic of all, uh, you know, answering any question or seeing any patient. It's uh, you've got to get your history right. So within the history, uh, it's, you know, with every history for anything, whether it's orthopedic or general surgical or medical, you always have to ask what occupation uh, does this person do? And obviously, if they're lift, lifting, you know, sacks of cement into a uh, truck every day and heavy physical labour, to, well, they might be more um, prone to getting a hernia. But the questions that people often forget to ask in respect to intra-abdominal pressure is, uh, what are their bowels like? Because once in a while, you will pick up that somebody has had increasing constipation and then they go, oh, well, actually, yes, my bowels have been abnormal for a while. And, oh, yes, actually, I have had some rectal bleeding. And, um, you know, it may well be that you can unmask uh, a more serious problem uh, than a hernia. So somebody might have a uh, sigmoid carcinoma that's causing an incomplete large bowel obstruction, and that's why they're straining. And, of course, in men, the other question you must ask is questions with related uh, related to the prostate. So, you know, how many times do you get up at night? What's your stream like? Do you have feelings of incomplete emptying? And it'd be, you'd be surprised how many cases of prostatism or benign BPH or even carcinoma get diagnosed because somebody's presented uh, with a hernia. So you must ask all those questions, apart from all the usual things like, you know, past surgical history, medications, allergies, and all that sort of thing. But those, those three particular questions, so occupation, bowel habit, and urinary habits are pretty important. And it's often useful to get a time frame on, uh, you know, when did you first get your symptoms? A lot of people just notice a lump when they're in the shower and they go, my God, what's that? I've got a cancer. I've got to see the doctor quickly, quick, quick, quick. But for a lot of people, it's a pain. It's just pain or an ache. And that's probably one of the biggest things that we have to differentiate as surgeons is, you know, what's causing that pain. So, uh, you know, it's very important to get that, that exact history. And then when do you get the pain? If somebody has pain, um, you know, after exerting themselves or doing their daily activities or occupation, well, sure, that might, uh, that might well be a hernia. If people only have pain perhaps going up and down stairs or getting in and out of cars, well, it might possibly be an osteitis pubis. So um, uh, the history is, is important. That brings up an interesting point. I do recall speaking to one of my patients about his hernia that he had developed. He told me that for the first week he just noticed pain going to the scrotal region rather than actually a lump. He told me that it took him a while to realise it was a hernia and actually it was more the pain that was initially for him initially. Is that a common story? I'd like to let you know that Aussie MedEd is supported by HealthShare. HealthShare is a digital health company that provides solutions for patients, GPs and specialists across Australia. Two of HealthShare's core products are Better Consult, a pre-consultation questionnaire that allows GPs to know a patient's agenda before the consult begins with the aim to reduce admin and free up time during a consult, and HealthShare's Specialist Referral Directory. A specialist and allied health directory integrated into GP practice management software, helping GPs find the right specialist. You can find out more from healthshare.com.au. Well, it is, it is, and that's probably, uh, it's hard to know the exact figures. It's probably about 50 50 uh, pain and lump, uh, or, or just lump or pain. Look, um, and what you what you're describing, Gav, is uh, entirely correct. You know, there's a there's a whole bunch of nerves that goes down with the somatic cord through the uh, um, uh, through the canal, especially the iliaingual nerve. Um, now that tends to cause a little bit of uh, uh, tingling down the inner aspect of the thigh. Uh, the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve also goes through there. You've got sympathetic fibres. So yes, often you get a uh, 
uh, you'll get a referred pain sort of thing. And um, uh, you'll get that just before the uh, hernia pops out. But our biggest problem is what if we can't actually feel anything? If it's just a pain, where do we go from there? So I guess that segues nicely into uh, um, examination. So we've taken our history, examination, and here, you know, students just have to remember, get the patient to stand up. It's one of those absolute things you have to get them to do. So it's like examining for varicose veins. You're not gonna see much when they're lying down. You must get them to stand up. So get them to stand up. They, uh, you know, have to uh, uh, disrobe adequately so that you can see and feel and ev everything. And of course, at this point, I hasten to add, always get a chaperone um, or ask the patient if, you know, they want a chaperone present. So get them to stand up and um, then put your, um, you know, after you've washed your hands, of course, uh, get them to cough, first of all, see if you can see anything, see if you can see any difference in the scrotum from one side to the other. And uh, and then uh, palpate. So I think most people these days would probably wear gloves, which is a good thing. Um, now, remember, a lot of people think are uh, inguinal and they put their hands over the hip flexure. That's not the inguinal region. It's It's higher than you think. So go back to your landmarks, feel for the pubic cubicle, and feel for the anterior superior lax spine. And there's your imaginary line, which is the inguinal ligament. So you just want to put your fingers just above the midpoint of that and uh, get them to cough, and then slide your fingers down a little bit more to where the superficial uh, femoral ring is, get them to cough, and then you can invaginate the scrotum into the uh, superficial ring, get them to cough. Now, look, it's difficult feeling for hernia. Some of them are obvious, they, they pop out, some of them you get the thrill, so that's the little uh, tickly feeling, I guess, when uh, they cough with raised intra-abdominal pressure. But they can be very, very difficult to feel sometimes. So after you've got them to stand up, then get them to lie down and repeat the procedure. Now, of course, um, if I was studying for my, if I was sitting for my fellowship exam, let's say I'd do a full abdominal examination, check for any masses. And I'd also, in the mail, I'd also suggest doing a rectal exam for the reasons that we sort of talked about before, because it may be that they've got a massive uh, prostate or you may even find blood on your glove after you've done it. So, so that's the way I'd approach, um, you know, examination, take your time, but get them to stand up get them to lie down and uh, see where it goes from there. So after history and examination, it's either obvious or it isn't. Uh, if it isn't, then then we go to uh, uh, investigations. Now, it would be fair to say that one of the biggest problems we have with hernias and assessment of hernias is the young, you know, 30 year old person that comes in, they've got groin pain, they're clutching an ultrasound that their GP has organized that says, there's a small indirect hernia and they come to you and they go, I want this hernia fixed. You take a history, it doesn't sound like a hernia. You examine them, you can't feel a hernia, but they're determined that they need an operation uh, because they've got an ultrasound. Now, I love our radiological fellows. They're fantastic and they help us out many, many times. But unfortunately with ultrasound, it tends to overcall hernias. You can imagine if you've got the ultrasound probe and you ask somebody to cough or strain. Now, anything that bulges into that inguinal canal uh, can get interpreted as a hernia. Now, is that a real hernia? Is it just a radiological hernia? Um, for many of us, we would take that all with a, with a grain of salt and we'd say, look, if we can't feel anything, then we shouldn't be doing an operation because really we haven't fully explained um, your pain. Now, hernia pain, if it's a severe pain, then something is incarcerated or caught or obstructed. Um, it doesn't tend to cause sort of nagging pain all the time. So you have to be very, very circumspect when somebody comes with an ultrasound. Um, now, ultrasound, of course, as we all know, is very operator dependent. So some, you know, some people are just absolute guns with this sort of thing and you'd stake your life on the fact that if they said there's a hernia, there must be a hernia. But in general, you know, unless we can feel a hernia, then uh, 
uh, with perhaps looking other areas for the pain. So that would introduce the idea of a sports sunscreen here in that 30-year-old. And uh, obviously, Absolutely. obviously you need to exclude other orthopedic issues too, like osteitis and uh, other types of muscular injuries as well. That's right. And, you know, the MRI has been, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, uh, adjunct to our, uh, um, you know, investigative uh, capabilities because if, if I examine someone and they're exquisitely tender over the pubic tubercle, I mean, that's unlikely to be a hernia. And then that brings up the whole, uh, you know, is it osteitis pubis? And, of course, uh, MRI is, uh, is very good for detecting that. And uh, I've used that on many occasions, and uh, uh, I've never regretted using it. And uh, that can certainly sort out, uh, um, you know, whether there's a, there's a musculoskeletal problem there as opposed to a uh, true hernia. You're saying the physical examination is the most important part. An MRI is yep. useful for excluding other pathology. Uh, ultrasound can pick up a hernia in good operators. Is there any other tests or investigations that we need to be aware of? Oh, look, once upon a time when I was a boy, uh, you know, many moons ago, there was an old thing called a herniogram where basically they used to uh, inject dye into the peritoneal cavity and get the patient to, uh, you know, cough and move in certain positions. Uh, one of the bosses, old bosses I worked for, used to swear by that, and, and that was pretty effective. But nobody does that anymore. Um, you know, sometimes you can see hernias on CT scans, just as a incidental finding. But of course, CT scans not a dynamic scan, so you can't sort of get the patient to cough and strain while you're doing a CT scan. It doesn't quite work that way. I guess what has changed in the last ten years or so has been the uh, uptake of uh, laparoscopic versus open inguinal hernia repairs. And for a lot of people now, if they're confronted by someone who's got a uh, uh, an ultrasound that says, yes, there are hernias there, um, you know, if they're proficient at laparoscopic repair, they might go, well, you know what, we'll stick the laparoscope in and have a look, and if there's a hernia there, we'll fix it up. So how often would a patient presenting with a hernia on one side develop symptoms on the other side? Well, I think if you if you just ask that question a bit differently, how many people with a symptomatic hernia have an asymptomatic hernia on the other side uh, detected on ultrasound? Uh, it's surprising. I, look, I couldn't give you the exact figures, but certainly uh, in my practice, we'd probably have uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent of people sort of clutching an ultrasound, saying, "Yes, there's a hernia on the right side, but there's also an asymptomatic one on the left." And, you know, it depends on the person. A lot of them say, look, just fix up the symptomatic side and that's fine. As long as they know what the risks of uh, uh, what to look out for in the future with the other asymptomatic side, if that becomes a problem. And I guess it's a good, it's a good time to talk about the, the two different approaches. Um, certainly uh, the open repair or the Lichtenstein repair uh, is where we make an incision in the skin uh, probably about uh, six to eight centimetres in length, so two fingers breadths above your inguinal ligament, and we uh, open up the external oblique aponeurosis. We find the spermatic cord and isolate that, and then we can say, okay, well, there's a sac uh, associated directly with the cord, which comes from the deep ring, so it's an indirect sac. Or we find a sac that's coming straight out from the posterior wall, and that's a direct sac. With direct sacs, we don't tend to open them up and push everything back in. We just tend to reduce the sac. With the indirect sacs that go down the cord, we tend to open the sac up, reduce the contents, and then uh, uh, resect the sac at the level of the deep inguinal ring. With both indirect and direct, the, the way we fix it is exactly the same. Uh, we usually plicate the posterior wall. That's just putting a few stitches in the posterior wall, and then we put some on-lay mesh, nylon mesh. Yeah, is mesh always used in hernia repairs? Or? Yeah, pretty much, Gav. Um, I don't know that there's any situation where we wouldn't use mesh now for inguinal hernias other than uh, in, the, in the little old man that comes in the middle of the night with an obstructed hernia and he's got uh, necrotic bowel or something, uh, so the field's a bit contaminated. There we just do a, a very old-fashioned... Uh, uh, repair with uh, a Bassini type darn, which is putting nylon sutures sort of backwards and forwards a little bit. 
that's about the only situation where we wouldn't use mesh. Now, of course, this mesh has been tried, true, and tested, and uh, look, you know, the amount of times that we have to remove pieces of mesh in the inguinal region, at least, for uh, uh, infection, it's very, 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 very seldom. So, um, um, no, we'd always use mesh. So that's an open repair, and that usually takes, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. It can be done as a day case. It can be done under local if the patient, you know, is really that unwell. We tell people don't do any heavy physical activity for about four weeks, but we've probably been a bit conservative with that. I think we're sort of getting people to go back into things a little bit sooner than they used to. Um, the laparoscopic repair can be uh, uh, done one of two ways. It can be done via an extra peritoneal approach. So that's where we make a cut in the skin and we find the... Uh, plane between the perineum and the um, and the muscles and we sort of go through that or into that plane uh, we uh, the various devices that open that plane up various balloons and we so we're looking at the inguinal canal and the inguinal structure from behind and that's the big difference that's a tep approach is it that's the tep approach that's right so the the sac can get reduced uh, we can see where all the vessels are and um, the mesh can be applied sort of on the undersurface, whereas with the open repair, we're putting mesh on top. Um, and I guess the beauty of the laparoscopic repair is that if there are bilateral hernias, they can both be fixed at the same time uh, with, along with a big piece of mesh. The TAP approach, so that's the transabdominal approach, doesn't get used so much anymore. There have been various... Uh, uh, changes to that approach over the years. Initially, the uh, uh, mesh was just applied to the peritoneum and uh, staples were used to fix it. Uh, but unfortunately, um, adhesions can occur to the mesh and uh, cause you know, strangulation, gangrene, uh, fistulas. So these days, if people do do the TAP approach, uh, they tend to um, pull the perit make a cut in the peritoneum pull it down like a leaf and put the mesh in between the muscle and the peritoneum. So uh, that's the difference. The, the tap approach you might do if you've got the patient that um, you're not sure if there's a hernia there and all the investigations are a bit up in the air, you can do the tap approach to look underneath to see if there's actually a hernia there. That's probably its real, uh, real benefit these days. And is surgery always recommended in, in hernias or can they be treated conservatively at all? Look, I think things are starting to uh, change a little bit. The exam question answer is uh, hernias should always be repaired uh, because um, they don't go away. Um, so if a patient comes to you with symptoms relating to a hernia, then they're going to keep getting symptoms from that hernia until it gets fixed. The hernia is likely to get bigger with time, especially you know the umbilical hernias, and we really haven't touched upon any incisional hernias, which can be a problem as well. And there's always the risk of strangulation. So that's when the contents of the hernia are unable to be reduced and uh, there's compromise of the uh, blood supply to whatever's trapped in that hernia. And that's usually just a bit of momentum, but it can be bowel, usually small bowel, but it can be large bowel, it can even be bladder. So that's what the emergency is. And certainly, if you were uh, had a hernia that you knew about and you were about to embark on your round-the-world trip, you wouldn't want to get an, a strangulated hernia, you know, on the top of the Andes or anywhere silly like that. So, look, the exam question answer is that we'd still repair it. Now, when uh, the patient is elderly and perhaps, you know, it's not causing them too much in terms of symptoms and it's been noticed by a family member or somebody at the nursing home or whatever, then we would perhaps say, look, you know, I think the, the risks of a hernia repair probably outweigh the benefit. And certainly with some of the smaller umbilical hernias, you know, people are quite happy to watch and, and see how they go. Uh, but generally speaking, we'd say that uh, uh, most true legitimate hernias should be fixed up. That introduces the idea of staging hernias. What terminology would you recommend a medical student use when talking about staging a hernia, such as incarcerated or irreducible or reducible, strangulated? What terminology would you recommend that they use, as well as the actual 
type of container they have. Yes, okay. So, first of all, you know, it's uh, like a TV show, location, location, location. So get the location right. See whether it's, uh, is it inguinal, is it femoral? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's really important. So uh, get your location right in the first place. Now, first of all, is it tender or non-tender? Is it reducible? So reducible means you can push it all back. And if you get them to cough, then it can pop back out again. So reducible, if you can't push it back, then it is irreducible. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, obstructed or, in, or incarcerated. It just means that you can't get it back at that point in time. If it's been out for a while and it's a little bit tender, then that starts going into the category of uh, incarcerated. And then on from that, if there's a lot of tenderness, then there's the whole question of ischemia and that becomes strangulation. So strangulation implies uh, that the blood supply is in trouble. So they're the basic categories, I guess. Excellent. That's, that covers a lot of work on hernias. I think for the last question I'm going to ask you, is this the femoral hernias? They're much more common in ladies, I understand. What's, what's the difference between that and a standard inguinal hernia? The, the difference between that and the standard inguinal hernia is that uh, the uh, femoral hernia, there's a much, much smaller defect. So a hernia is, a hernia is split up into a sac, so that's the balloon. It's, it's got a neck, so that's the bit coming from the defect into the balloon, and then you've got the defect, defect itself. So all hernias can be you know, subdivided into those components. Now, the defect through which a femoral hernia goes is very, very small. So things are much more likely to strangulate, and that's the problem with a femoral hernia. And because it's in an awkward position, so it's below the... So if we go back to our inguinal ligament, pubic tubercle, anterior superior lax spine, femoral hernia has always got to be below that line. So if there's a, if there's a tender lump, that is below the inguinal ligament and kind of medial to the pubic tubercle, you're talking about um, a possible femoral uh, hernia. And it's a great exam question. How do you tell the difference between an inguinal and a femoral hernia on examination? Well, inguinal hernia is going to be above the inguinal ligament and it comes out, sorry, it comes out medial to the pubic tubercle. A femoral hernia will be below the inguinal ligament and be just lateral to the pubic tubercle. So, um, but look, in reality, it can be very difficult to uh, determine, and sometimes the best thing, uh, best way to determine is to do an operation. So the femoral hernia is much more of an uh, emergency procedure than an inguinal hernia, and there are various approaches for it, but often, um, you know, there can be a little knuckle of incarcerated uh, bowel and especially if any of our listeners are ever faced with the situation of the little old lady that comes in with a small bowel obstruction they've never had uh, any major medical conditions nor have they had uh, any surgery in the past make sure that you look in the groin looking in the groin should be part of every standard abdominal examination because if you look in the groin you might find that tender little nodule which will tell you ah there's a femoral hernia so that's a surgical emergency and should be fixed up uh, post haste. Well, that's brilliant you've really answered a lot of questions on hernias that we may have had and really summarise it in a nice simple way to help medical students or GPs in their area look I really appreciate having you on board and uh, thanks again for a really good summary of hernias from Martin Bruning Yeah no that's uh, my pleasure Gav so you know for the students uh you know, you just have to take a good history. You have to get them to stand up in the examination, um, a physical examination. Don't put all your uh, trust completely in ultrasounds and then, you know, take things from there. But, uh, you know, it is a tricky, uh, a tricky area. And if you can uh, have the opportunity to... Uh, to go and see an open hernia and assist in an open hernia, uh, please grab it with both hands because uh, things start to make a little bit of sense once you've actually, you know, had a look at it. Well, that's brilliant, Barton. Thanks very much for coming on Aussie Med Ed and really appreciate your simplified approach to assessing hernias. Once again, thanks again.
All right, good on you, Gab. See you later on. The information provided to you today is designed to complement the information provided to you in your local region and should supplement your readings and teachings in that area. Please don't take it as the only way of treating this condition or assessing a condition, but really as one, one of various ways of assessing these conditions. Please be also be aware that the information provided today is really just general medical advice and isn't designed to actually be a source of medical information regarding your particular condition. Remember to consult your specialist or medical practitioner if you have concerns about a condition raised in this podcast. Well, thanks once again for listening to our podcast, Aussie Med Ed or the Australian Medical Education Podcast. We really enjoy hosting this podcast. I hope you find it useful to hear a pragmatic approach to everyday conditions. If you have any questions or information you want to ask about us, or you'd like to put a suggestion for a topic, please don't hesitate to email us at gavin at ed-ed.com.au. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed listening to it and we look forward to hosting it next fortnight when we introduce a new topic. Thank you. Aussie Med Ed is proudly sponsored by HealthShare, a digital health company that provides solutions for patients, GPs and specialists across Australia, and Tego, offering medical indemnity insurance for doctors. That's tego.com.au.